plans, the PowerPoint will be available on the website afterwards, and we will email it out to everybody who was here. OK, uh, welcome everyone to our grants interest meeting for round 25. Uh, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Also with us today is Nikita Afaha. Uh, she is our program manager and she is going to get us started with introductions. So go ahead, Nikita. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so if you would please in the chat, introduce yourself. And again, as Jeff said, my name is Nikita Afaha and I am the program uh, manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. So welcome. In the chat, please share with us your, your institution, department, um, whether or not this is your first time with uh, Affordable Learning Georgia or returning. And also, what um, or why is affordable resources important to you? So go ahead and put that in the chat and um, we'll read a few of those and kind of get ourselves acquainted. I'll just pause for a moment and let a few get in before I start to read those. Thank you for everyone who is willing to participate. Morning to David and Todd. From GDC, thank you very much. Georgia Gwinnett College, welcome. We have some joining us this morning from Columbus State and uh, a return from Columbus State. Very nice, very nice. And uh, we have, uh, mm, yes, more from Columbus State there and from Con KSU coming in now. Thank you very much. Yes. So we won't take too long with this section because we do have quite a bit to cover today. Please continue to put these in the chat as we get acquainted with each other. Welcome to Walt and uh, from Georgia State and from uh, also University of North Georgia is joining us. Quite a few, quite a few people from uh, Georgia College and State University is here, some UGA, very welcome to all of you. Okay, Jeff, I'm going to pass it over to you so that we can continue on and get going. I know we have a lot to cover today. Everyone, please continue to put your chats in the put your information in the chat as we introduce ourselves to each other. Hi, everyone. I'm seeing a lot of uh, return folks and some new people. So welcome. Um, <clears throat> I read uh, over here from Susan that the uh, Faculty Center and the Center for Online Learning at Columbus State is all on one uh, account and sharing this out. So hello. Wow, so many. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Indeed. Yes. All right. The first thing I want to do is share a couple of links that you're going to. Yeah, a watch party. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I want to share a couple of links that are very important to applying for a grant. The first one is the most important, and it's the apply for a grant page, of course. Right. Um, so this is at affordablelearninggeorgia.org. If you go to the grants menu, um, apply for the apply for a grant is right in there. There's also a button that says apply for a grant, so you'd be able to get to that very quickly. Um, along with that, though, there's also the grants archive. That archive has every completed project uh, all the way up to now, uh, including some in progress uh, projects going on. And if you want to see anything from your institution, you can filter by that. If you want to see anything by a particular uh, project lead, you can even search uh, for that as well. And it, when you go to the links on each of those that are listed, you can see the materials that were either created or shared for the project, and you can find all of the grant documents too. Uh, so you can see the original proposal that wound up uh, going through. Um, also, we have our staff and champions page. Uh, you have Affordable Learning Georgia champions at your institution. Uh, some of them are on the call today, so hello to all the champions. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, open educational resources or about uh, no cost or low cost resources, and you didn't quite find out any, uh, something here today that's very specific to your course, uh, reach out to your champions. They are very helpful people who know this stuff very well. Uh, and if there's ever anything that stumps them, they would reach right out to me too. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's great to have an ALG presence on your campus, and uh, these people are wonderful to uh, get in touch with. So that's uh, the three really big links that you should be aware of. I'll go through um, the grants, just a quick overview of what they are, um, all three of our categories. The first ones are the transformation grants. And these are the first ones that we ever started. Uh, they were first issued in fall 2024. And uh, that that group had one semester to go from applying for the grant to doing all the implementation work and putting it into their course. Uh, that was uh, an athletic feat of uh, academia for sure. Um, now we give an entire year for folks to get that work done. And transformation grants take the idea that there are expensive materials in a lot of courses. And if you are given the time to create and to adopt uh, open and no cost resources, then you could uh, save students money uh, in the long run. So this is why we talk about transformation in these particular grants. They are transforming entire courses to ones that use commercial textbooks uh, to using OER and other affordable materials. Now, the transformation grants are the one case that involves savings estimates, and these are very important. Most of our, uh, so the other grants that you'll see, the ones that have an M on them and the ones that have an RG on them, those are our continuous improvement and research grants. They are not transforming a course from using expensive materials to using not expensive materials. So they don't have all of these numbers the way that transformation grants do. Um, in a proposal for transformation grants, you'll need to know a couple of things. What are the average number of students you have per semester in the summer, the fall, and the spring? Now, you, you might have a summer one, summer two, summer three. You might have a winter session that's connected to spring. We just do the three big semesters. Um, otherwise, our data would get all segmented and weird. Uh, so be sure that you have those estimates for how many students are going to be affected by the project. Um, then you sum all of those up. That is the amount of students that would be affected in a whole year. Uh, you'll need to know the original cost of the required materials. Um, do this to the best of your knowledge. If you've got the bookstore price, that's good. That's exactly how it is at Columbus State, uh, we would then know a very accurate estimate of how much students would be saving. Um, if there's a, kind of a direct to vendor deal uh, or there's a third party thing that just about everybody uses, you would want to use that one uh, because that's what students are typically using in the course. And we want to get as close to what students actually spend to be in this course and to have the materials on day one. Um, so the, and this is the new cost of the required materials. Um, we're not assuming that every student can just find a used bookstore, find exactly what they're looking for in the right edition for the previous materials being used and have that on day one. Um, so we just want to make sure that we have an accurate enough estimate of what it would take for a student to have the optimal materials that are required for the course. Um, then the savings per student affected because the the required materials at the end of the project, they are usually zero, but every so often we've gone to a low cost homework platform or something like that. So it may be that students pay $20 now and they paid 200 before. So that means that the savings per student would be 180, right? It wouldn't be 200 because they are paying 20. So you do need to know um, if there are any costs associated with the required materials that students will have to pay afterwards. Um, then your annual savings, you take the annual amount of students and the savings per student in one course, um, and you multiply those together and you get your number. Now, let's say that you have um, three courses in the project and you're saying, well, OK, a student goes through all three of these courses in their major and therefore uh, they've purchased all of these materials, uh, this material, this one and this one. Uh, and then we will multiply it by all three of those required materials per student. Then you're going to wind up with something like $600 per student saved uh, in one course in one enrollment, and that will look really weird. 
Uh, be sure to make this her enrollment in a course. Um, one of the things is that we just can't assume that every student is going to complete the first one, move on to the second one, complete the second one, move on to the third one, complete that one. Uh, the other thing is this is another data issue where if we are going at a course level for everybody and then all of a sudden there's a three course level in one, it gets all uh, mixed up and very confusing at that point. Uh, so make sure that you are multiplying the annual amount of student enrollments per course by the savings per student. Uh, the funding here, uh, there is 5,000 maximum per individual team member. Now, depending on the institution you're at, this can mean different things. Um, you could be covered for uh, a course release, for example, which would involve your salary. Uh, it could be also a uh, course overload, so you would be doing extra work. Um, it could also be professional development. Uh, different institutions have different requirements on this. There are some that say we are not doing any overloads, we're not doing any course releases, uh, we have no time and no additional staff to do a course release, therefore here are your options. Um, that's why you've got to reach out to your grants or business office. We have a required form in here that says, hey, you've gotten in touch with the grants or business office, they've signed it. Um, that's super important that you know what's available for you at your institution. And not just that, but what's available at your institution with the uh, status that you have too. So part-time instructors or adjunct instructors may have different policies attached to them than full-time instructors. And that's partially because sometimes there are 12 month contracts and there are nine month contracts. And if the nine month people are doing summer pay, you're paid in the summer in your salary. So it gets a little wonky there. Uh, so this stuff is especially meant to be worked out at the business office. I get some questions about this from time to time. And I would say 96 to 97% of them uh, have a response of, you've really got to talk to your grants or business office. Uh, there are additional project expenses allowed in, uh, in these within the maximum total per grant. So if you have materials or if you have professional development that um, you want to do, you can include that in here. It needs to be justified in the proposal and in the budget. So it needs to you need to make sure that if you're saying, well, we need four thousand dollars for laptops. Well, why do you? Um, you know, like you, you probably already have IT equipment uh, per your institution. So what's different about this? Why why is it needed for uh, this particular project? That kind of thing uh, gets read both in peer reviews and in administrative reviews. So that's super important stuff. And yeah, the maximum uh, total award per grant is 30,000. So please keep that in mind. Uh, see the RFP for more details on how funding works. Um, some institutions are very new to this. Others, it's you know, it's like clockwork for them. Uh, and there's turnover at every institution's grant office from time to time. So uh, people may have some new questions for you. Uh, just uh, those questions are usually detailed in the RFP. But of course, if they are not, they can reach right out to me. Uh, so yeah, other project costs, um, like if you are going to purchase software to do this, uh, some equipment or travel, uh, just make it really clear to the reviewers, to anyone who's reading this proposal, why that's necessary. Uh, I'm not saying don't do it for sure. I, there, there are projects where you will need some software to do some really cool stuff. Uh, there are projects where you might need some actual physical equipment to do stuff. That's perfectly fine. Um, it just needs to be clear. Now, continuous improvement grants are a little different, like I said before, um, because they don't involve numbers. You are not saving students new money um, on uh, the course materials. What you're doing is you're improving a low cost or no cost course by creating new OER or revising OER. So let's say that you have, um, you got a business course and things change in business from year to year. The pandemic happened and now we are in post pandemic land. And, uh, you know, this business textbook, this open textbook that you've been using from uh, 2018 has a lot of great principles in it, but all of the examples are out of date. Uh, you would then 
be doing a substantial revision of that open textbook, which is cool because then you can share that new revision out and then everybody has a new revision of that business textbook. I, I love open for that reason. Um, and also, if you needed to just create new OER, uh, there are some institutions out there who said, you know what, textbooks are cool, but let's create an entire video series instead and make the textbook a video series. And they've done that. They've created entirely new open resources uh, that have done that instead. Or you could write an entirely new textbook. Maybe you were using uh, sources from all over the web and you said, let's bring these all in. They all have an open license anyway. Um, we can put them under one roof. We can give them one singular voice. That's a really neat way uh, to make a new open textbook too. And these need to be substantial revisions of OER or the creation of new OER. Um, if you were going to apply for this and say, well, we're going to redo the syllabus a little bit. We're going to move some uh, subjects around and uh, that's about it. Well, that's not uh, how it works. If you have routine course revision work, um, we're not paying for that. What we are paying for is a revision of existing OER or the creation of new OER that makes the implementation in your course even better. Um, that involves uh, full textbooks, but it also involves ancillary materials. So let's say that you had um, a whole set of lecture slides that were connected to your uh, previous open textbook. You're moving to a new one. That open textbook already exists. It's perfectly fine, but you've got to create an entirely new lecture series for this. And maybe you want to give an audio version for folks who are uh, driving who also want to hear this uh, as they're going. Uh, or maybe you want a video supplement or something like that. Those totally work uh, as ancillary materials, um, as well as simulations, games, any any cool stuff that will supplement uh, the instruction in a course. You can do that. Um, and the funding is 2000 maximum per team member. Same thing applies. Be sure to get in contact with your grants office. Uh, project expenses are allowed. You have to justify them in the proposal budget, and it is 10,000 maximum total award per grant. Um, once again, funding has some additional stuff to go with it uh, and some Q&A that really helps out uh, grants offices. The RFP has more details on that. And research grants. This is our last category of grants. It's our newest one. They just started this year. Why do we have them? Well, it's great that we have so many uh, folks who are transforming their courses and making stuff affordable. It's also great when they take that stuff and make it even better in continuous improvement grants. And we can say like, yay, this is happening. We we love that. But what about the big questions that happen? Um, you know, do students really perform better when they get access to materials on day one? If you involve them in the project, are they learning even more? Um, what what do students think of professors who bring in OER? Uh, you know, you might be thinking like, well, do they think that you get what you pay for and therefore it's free? And, you know, like, do they have the same opinion that uh, my colleagues do? That kind of stuff is something you'd want to explore in research more than you'd want to say, well, we're going to transform a course or we're going to make OER. So that's why we have these. Uh, they address one or more aspects of the Open Education Group's coup framework. Um, I am linking to an article that lists these. The Open Education Group's website is uh, it's owned by somebody who is in a new job, so they are trying to figure that out. Uh, but really, there are four categories of it, cost, outcomes, usage, and perceptions. Obviously, cost is one thing that we look at in all of these, but outcomes has to do with learning outcomes. Sometimes that means, OK, student grades. But other times that may mean, uh, let's say that you're looking at uh, their career path. If you've got data that goes five years past the point of uh, them graduating and they've taken like one or two OER courses with that data, can you answer that kind of cool question? So it's not just grades. And there are also standardized tests out there too. Um, psychology has a, a bit of a standardized test that they can do in introduction courses. Um, physics sometimes does that as well. So when they say they're measuring learning outcomes, they're not just measuring GPA, they're measuring um, what happens on a widely accepted test. Uh, usage, so 
there were some Kennesaw State uh, people that did some very early projects. And one of the things that they did was analyze whether or not students were actually reading the materials now that they were open and available to them. Um, they did some uh, Google Analytics work with some proper disclosure, of course, that yes, they're using Google Analytics on the website. Um, and then they uh, brought that into some uh, additional research and surveys and stuff. So it was it was cool to see that. And yeah, to see how usage happens in, in this is really neat. And then, of course, perceptions. Like I said before, uh, you know, what do students think about when you're adopting uh, materials? What do faculty around you think about these materials? Um, what do you think? Like, there's there's a lot of ways that this can uh, work. And so, yeah, they end with a research report at the end of the final semester of the project. Um, these reports are a basic rundown of what happened and what you found. Um, they'll be shared in our repository. Uh, they'll be CC BY, a Creative Commons Attribution License. Um, you will not be sharing out data sets unless you want to. Um, you can say that, yes, we want to share out this data set. That's totally fine. No personal, identi uh, personal identifiable information or PII should be shared, especially with, um, you know, compliance with things like FERPA for that. Um, so the outline of a research report, uh, just like any other report, you have some standard information about the team. Uh, then you have a summary of the project, including your research design, your methods, uh, your goals, what did you want to achieve, um, and then your findings and some applicability. Like, do you think that this means a, a difference in practice because of this? Um, a description, but you don't have to replicate uh, the supplementary files like your data sets. You just say these are also available or, you know, we also have these. Uh, then future plans. So are you going to publish this? Are you going to take it to a conference? Are you going to make a, a website with these materials and share it out even bigger? Um, you know, that kind of stuff is really neat. Uh, when you're doing a research report, there are some things you want to consider. One of them is uh, IRB approval. That's um, an institutional decision most of the time. So be sure you have a plan for when you're going to run this stuff by the IRB. Um, some of these projects are, you know, a lot of them because they have to do with improving teaching and learning at your institution um, can be exempt, but IRB has to say that, yes, it is. Um, journal article publication. So if you're thinking about doing research, think about where you're going to uh, publish. Uh, there are great open access publications out there, uh, especially in uh, particular fields like um, physics has archive, for example. Uh, and it's a great place to go for that stuff. But if you want um, to publish in a journal that uh, is not open access because your particular field or your tenure and promotion procedures do not uh, allow that or it doesn't really benefit there, um, then you don't have to publish in open access. We encourage it, but it's not required. The funding structure is the same as the uh, continuous improvement grants, 2000 maximum per team member for salary, for course release, for travel. Uh, additional projects expenses are allowed. You have to justify them. Uh, see the RFP for more details. I'm going to pass it over to Nikita to talk a little bit about the timeline and the kickoff meeting. All right, everyone. So let me speak to the timeline um, very quickly. So. For round 25, we've got all of our projects that um, will be ending in fall uh, 2024 through spring 2025. Um, and the first major um, date is going to be Monday, March 11th, that you see. Um, that's the application deadline. And all of our application deadlines are typically by midnight. Um, then on Tuesday, April 2nd of 2024, we'll have the notifications out for um, those applications that were considered. And by Monday, April 8th, on the 2024, we will have agreements, SLA sent out for signatures for those applications, um, for the notifications and the, who are grantees at that point. Um, well, of course, they'd be grantees after the signatures. Um, by Friday, May 3rd, we'll have our online kickoff meeting. It is a virtual meeting. Um, and that'll be, be, of course, for those who have been awarded the, the grant, um, who have the agreement signed as well. And then Friday, uh, January 10th, 
2025, we will have our midpoint check-in. Um, and this is something new, but we are, um, you know, committed to making sure that you feel, um, you know, um, completely in, in check with the process throughout the entire year. Sometimes it can get a little um, spaced and um, away from us. So we want to make sure that we check in with you in the midpoint and answer any questions that you might have. And then Friday, May 16th, we have um, the reports and materials due, the reports that Jeff just explained for all three types of grants. Um, and they're, they're, what needs to be in those reports, those reports and the materials, the products from the projects will be due on Friday, May 16th for, uh, for around 25. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. So there's a couple of requirements for the kickoff meeting that I was mentioning, the virtual kickoff meeting. At least one team member from your project team will be required to participate in the online, um, and it is a synchronous kickoff meeting and in the midpoint check-in meeting. Um, all members of your project team are required to participate participate in a web based asynchronous training. Um, so now if you completed this training training before within a year, then you're exempt from this requirement. Um, but all otherwise everyone will need to participate in the asynchronous training for kickoff. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that that training needs to be done before the actual kickoff meeting. And Jeff, yes. you can step in if that's yeah, thank you. So you'll need to have that kickoff, that asynchronous training done before the kickoff meeting. Okay, and um, there's still more to come. We still have more information to share with you about the run through, how to apply for grants. And so that's gonna be some very information, good information for you. Um, but of course, before we start with that, if we um, have any questions about everything that we've just went through, my Jeff and myself, if you have any questions, you, you can unmute now or stick it in the chat so that we can kind of address those before we get into the next section. I'll pause for a moment for that. Hi, um, I, I do have a quick question, um, and maybe this is going to warrant a further discussion outside of the meeting. Um, just not entirely sure about what type of grant I should be looking for for my specific idea, because <clears throat> um, it, it does involve a research component, but not like SOTO research the way that y'all were talking about it with you know student mindsets and outcomes and things like that but i'm not entirely sure if it really fits with a continuous improvement grant either um it's kind of sort of the it's a creation of new material but it's not really um updating already existing content and it it is gonna create the new material based on um relevant research of how this one concept is is already taught and basically proposing like, hey, we should be teaching it this way instead. Um, and I don't know if like maybe these grants are just not what I should be looking for, but I was, I was, um, you know, strongly encouraged to look into OER for that for my idea. Um, but yeah, so I guess I guess my question is, um, if I'm creating new content that's not necessarily an upgrading of already existing OER material, but it involves my own research pursuits about how things are taught like should i just do it as a continuous improvement grant yeah uh send send us an email so that we can get the details on this okay. i don't want to steer you down the wrong path if uh, it's weighted one way or another but this does sound like a continuous improvement grant where you're creating new oer to supplement what you're already doing um, and the fact that it's based in research in the field is really cool um, but yeah. I'm sure that the details on this uh, make it a little bit interesting. So yeah, just uh, send it right over. Let me just um, type it in. And while Jeff is putting in his email, I believe, or quick. There I'll we go. Both of us. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll speak. Uh, I'll speak generally as well. And I think Jeff will actually touch on this in the next section about the application. But we do have a kind of a a, a picker online on our website so that you can um, um, go through and, and get closer to, you know, go through a, a set of questions in order to get closer to which type of grant you should apply to. So in general, that tool is there. Um, but in for specific special questions, definitely feel free to email either of us um, uh, just specifically because he's got, got a lot more experience to, to kind of help you decide. And Jeff, if there's anything else to add, but before we move on, there's a couple of hands up. So. Yep, uh, we got David first. 
Go ahead, David. Maybe you're, you're not muted, so oh, there we go. Uh, I think your microphone may not be working or it may be the wrong microphone selected. Uh, David, would you mind typing yours in the chat? Um, let's let's hear from uh, from Gregory, if that's possible. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep. Hey, hi. Um, yes, yeah, so I had a question about continuous improvement grants and cost sharing. Is cost sharing something that's a thing? Is that allowed? And if so, does it change the probability of getting funded? I.e., like if if the department kicks in some funds to make the project a success. I think you'd want to put that into the proposal. Um, you just have to make it really clear where this funding is going to help and where the departmental funding is going to help. Um, and you know whether or not it takes both of them to get it done. If I'm thinking from a peer reviewer's perspective, uh, you know there's a certain amount of funding that's going to go into this, um, and they would probably ask, okay, well, if your department's going to kick in this much, why do you need this other part of it? I think just making it very clear um, why it's needed is going to be helpful. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, David is. Uh, typing into chat. Oh, OK. I do this in Teams all the time. I accidentally hit enter and then it just. Uh, the. Uh, part of it just winds up in there. I'm sorry, I, I left the channel. Someone was talking and I and I left. I'm so sorry. I was looking I was looking at the um, the the messaging about the email and it like kicked me out for some reason. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm on my phone. That's, I think that's why. But oh, I, I okay. Just, oh, sorry. No problem. Um, yeah, thank you. And Jeff, if while we're waiting for David um, to finish the question, of, um, I think he may be starting with the fact that they applied for a grant before, perhaps, and maybe weren't selected. And so um, if you could just maybe mention, Jeff, real quickly, if you um, applied before and weren't selected, um, what the process is to apply again, which it's pretty straightforward, but just so we can clarify that for anyone who is in that category. Yeah. So we want as many great projects to happen as possible. Uh, we can't fund all of them in one year, but we do want uh, folks to to try it out. Uh, maybe their first time applying, they don't wind up with um, an accepted proposal, but uh, it's possible that they take the feedback that both we have and the peer reviewers have um, and re, uh, resubmit in another round. Part of the issue with uh, having rounds of grants is that sometimes suddenly we have like 70 applications. Uh, last round, 24, was the, uh, in a multi-grant year, it is the most we've ever had. Uh, we In round two, we had one round of grants and we got the word out about it and we got like 78. But we have never in this kind of cycle wound up with 70 proposals before. That was a lot. So um, peer reviewer feedback can help sometimes. We select a lot of peer reviewers. Uh, they um, differ in their style. Uh, and, you know, if you've ever applied uh, to uh, have a, your article published in a journal, you know about this too. Uh, things like, oh, it's always reviewer too. That kind of thing does happen from time to time. But we also do administrative reviews, and that's going to be right in the email of how this can be more effective the next time around. Um, yeah, OK, uh, David uh, said, OK, one of the reviewers while, question whether while you're reading that, Jeff, mm -hmm. I'd like to respond to David while you're reading his message so you can get the details on it. But David, my my response to you is um, going to be a less detailed than what Jeff has to say. He's going to tell you the very details right now. But I wanted to mention or reiterate what Jeff just said at the fact that it is a competitive process. And so um, it's not necessarily that a particular reviewer um, uh, was why a particular grant did not go through or not, but certainly we can only award so many within a round. And so it may not have been, been that your, your proposal wasn't good enough, right, for a grant, but certainly we just, um, in the 
in the competitiveness, um, the, the more competitive uh, proposals get funded first. So Jeff, have you had time to read and digest that? So yeah, can, I mean, yeah. there isn't a term for uh, there isn't a term for not being accepted that's positive enough to reflect what I think we try to do here. Uh, we do not want you to think, oh, OK, well, we're shot out from ALG forever because we didn't make it into this one round. Um, the amount of applications we get, the quality of those applications, it, it differs every single time. It's a. Uh, you know, we deal we deal with a lot of uncertainty uh, over here in Grantville. You know, um, so definitely take it as uh, you know some time to revise and resubmit. Um, David says, you know, do we need to provide additional explanations in the application for why the materials needed updating because they had published it in 2018 and the peer reviewer said, well, this wasn't uh, you know, it wasn't uh, far away enough. Um, I would say make it really clear what needs to be updated. The more detailed you have your plan, the better. Um, what Noel was asking too, how specific do we need to be regarding the time spent, uh, hours, days, weeks? I would estimate the amount of time, so the amount of hours it would take per task, and maybe stick to hours. Because if you're talking about days, well, you know, if you're going to say full days, that's one thing. Uh, if you're going to put, you know, seven days of the summer aside to do this many hours of it, you're still in hours, right? Um, I would, yeah, try to go from like a bit of a project management perspective of how long in hours is it going to take? And that way, not only will we understand that, but peer reviewers will understand like how long it takes to get this stuff done. Um, so yeah, I think that that's part of it. Um, not just what you're going to revise, but how long that revision is going to take and when is it going to happen? Because we're all busy people. What, you know, where is this in the schedule? Um, so yeah, uh, David, absolutely do revise and resubmit. And uh, Noel, I think keeping it uh, to hours especially helps. But you know, the more detailed your timeline is, the better. So if you're saying, well, we're going to put uh, 50 hours into this and someone goes, wow, that's a lot. Well, where the heck are you going to do that? And you say, well, in the summer in uh, from June 15th to July 20th, we have this open time in which not much happens and therefore we're going to be able to do this now. Like that kind of thing is super helpful for anyone who wants to know what your plans are. I hope that that uh, answered everybody's question there. Thank and you. Thank start. you for asking it, David. Yeah. And Noel, thank you for your question as well. Hopefully that mm -hmm. was uh, answered your question. Uh, anyone else want to unmute or drop in a chat before we move on? We'll pause a few seconds more and Jeff, when you feel comfortable, go ahead and take on for the next section. All right, so here's how to apply. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, share my apply for a grant page over here in my uh, window. So the first thing that you'll see is uh, that the round 25 applications are open and here's the interest meeting link. This will have uh, this video and the slides if you need them later on. Um, the important dates over here, so uh, this will already have passed, this online interest meeting. Hi, everybody, we're here. Um, March 11th is the round 25 application deadline. So the first thing that you want to do is read the request for proposals. If I went through the RFP, this would be way too much time. We, I don't want to go into uh, lunch. So. Uh, check this out. Um, check out the details that you're interested in. Um, if you have questions about how funding works, this is uh, a great place to go. Um, the grant rubrics are another thing that are super helpful. Uh, we'll go a little bit into these if we have enough time at the end, but there's one for transformation, one for continuous improvement, and one for research grants. They're slightly different from each other. For example, the transformation grant rubric will have something about uh, the impact for student savings. The continuous improvement rubric is going to be more about uh, teaching and learning and your organization, your plan. 
The research grant is going to involve uh, methodology, so that's part of this one. So this is how peer reviewers are going to be scoring your stuff. They're going to be looking at the rubric dimensions, and they're going to answer based on those. Um, it is all contained within the rubric. Uh, then you fill out the Word version of the application. Now, it seems weird that we have both an online form and a Word version, but there's a good reason for it. The Word version is used for peer review and it's used for administrative review. It's the place that we go to see exactly what you've planned out. It's not easy for us to look at that in Excel. We don't want a whole narrative in uh, the online application form and then it's cut off at a certain point because of the character limit. Um, or, you know, we're looking in Excel and we're trying to like blow up the cells. It's, you know, it would be feasible for us. It would be impossible if we were asking our peer reviewers to do that too. So that's why you have a Word application form. Plus, you will always have a Word document. Um, and so if you ever need to refer to it, it's always going to be there. And here it is. Here's round 25. Um, we have a link to the apply for a grant page just in case. You can get rid of any italic text, so that is stuff that's just meant for clarifications. Here is the uh, applicant and team information. Um, this is basic stuff, uh, the applicant name, uh, the submitter name. If there's a submitter who is different from the applicant, so at Georgia Gwinnett College, uh, everything is submitted through one grants office. That's pretty cool. They're going to put their submitter name and email below. Otherwise, if you're the project lead, applicant name, email, position title, you don't have to worry about submitter. Um, other team members, so name, email address, name, email address, uh, making sure that we have everybody that we can contact. Any more team members than six additional ones, add them in here. I don't think we've had a team above eight team members, but eh, it can happen. Um, the project information, um, so your priority category, if you have one. If we have time, we'll go into that, but this is all in the RFP. This is just for transformation grants. Um, the requested amount of funding, final semester. Uh, when you don't select the final semester for transformation grants, we give you a year. It ends in spring 2025. Um, if you say, well, it could end in fall 2024, it's better for you to have that additional time. Um, I'm sorry and to are, interrupt, yep. Jeff. I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you are you trying to show us the actual uh -oh. application form? Because we're just seeing oh, the Oh no. Yeah, we're just seeing the um the website at the moment. Can you see it now? Let's yes, we can see it now. Thank you so sorry much. Sorry about that. Here I am talking yeah. about what this thing looks like <laughs> and not showing you. Um no worries. so yeah, the final semester, it's always spring 2025. Um, you can select whether or not you're using an OpenStax textbook. Uh, OpenStax from time to time will reach out and say like, hey, how many people are using our textbooks? And you know, we'll show them here are the grant teams that are using it if you would like to reach out. Uh, impact data, um, yep, so fill in the data below. So course title and number, course instructors, uh, average number of students enrolled in the effective course per year. Um, that's per year, then summer, fall, spring, required commercial materials. Same exact thing here, uh, cost per student section enrollment. So this is per enrollment in a course, not per student taking multiple courses. Um, then there's the average post project cost. So you would subtract uh, row seven, which is the post project cost from row six, which is the original cost to get annual student savings. You do that for course two. Now, this is not for different sections of the course taught by different instructors. Uh, do one course, all instructors. Uh, otherwise, you'd have a list that goes on forever if you have an eight person team who's teaching like five sections of different courses. Uh, and there's just more room for different courses here. Then the narrative section, your goals. And this is your goals that go beyond just saving students money. Um, what does it have to do with their success? Uh, materials creation, what are you going to make out of this? Are you going to transform the way that you teach? That goes here too. Uh, statement of transformation, why does your department need it? Uh, why does your institution uniquely need it? Action plan, this is where all of the uh, project planning goes in, including um, exactly uh, how long this uh, these tasks are going to take. Uh, qualitative and quantitative measures, so any uh, any kind of measurement you're doing, evaluation, that goes here. 
um, the timeline. So keep this pretty detailed and <clears throat> related to your action plan. Making sure that you've got a good timeline that fits the tasks that you have to do. And then the budget fits uh, the tasks that you have to do as well. Um, and we you know, reiterate the amount here. Sustainability plan. So how will this be? Um, how will this be uh, sustainable moving forward? Um, how will you update things, maintain them? Uh, how will you continue the use of them? Are you maybe looking to expand it in the future? That stuff goes right there. Then there's uh, terms for Creative Commons for accessibility, uh, a letter of support. This just describes what the letter of support is, and this describes what the grants or business office acknowledgement form is, just to make sure. Now that's the transformation grant one. I'm going to go much more quickly through the other ones. So this is the continuous improvement one. Uh, the continuous improvement grant uh, has a lot of the same stuff. You can select fall 2024 or spring 2025 in a continuous improvement grant. Uh, exi <clears throat> existing resources that you're going to revise or create. Um, project goals, just like before. Action plan, just like before. Timeline, same thing. Budget, uh, Creative Commons terms, accessibility terms, letter of support, acknowledgement form, and that's it. So we don't have the number stuff in there. and We don't have uh, evaluation methods in there. Uh, because this is not a transformation, this is just uh, materials to improve. Research grants, this is a little bit different. So you'll see the research topics included here, uh, one sentence maximum. This is just kind of almost a title. Um, if you have any course titles or course numbers involved in your research, they go right here. You can select fall or spring. Uh, research methods, so if you have any qualitative or quantitative methods being used, list them here. And then which uh, parts of the framework are you addressing? Cost, outcomes, usage, perception. Uh, research questions. Uh, these are the questions that you're going to address in, in your research. The action plan, uh, just like the other ones. A review plan for IRB. Um, it can be easy. It can be very complex. It depends on the place. Uh, be sure that you outline that here. Uh, the timeline, just like the other ones. Budget, just like the other ones. Publication plan, so where do you plan to publish these findings? Uh, Creative Commons, accessibility terms, letter of support, acknowledgement form, same thing. So now I'm going to go back over uh, to our apply for a grant page. So once you've filled out one of these, you make sure that you've got a signed letter of support from uh, someone that is above the organizational level uh, of the team. So let's say that your department chair is on the project. They're in the project team. Well, they can't be the one that signs the letter of support. So you'd have to go one up from there. Uh, that would sometimes mean uh, the dean of the college. Uh, that sometimes would mean the provost if the dean is on the team. Uh, it depends on the organizational structure, but you will need a signed letter of support and to meet with your grants or your business office um, to talk with them about how this project works, how it works at your institution. Um, and they will then know who you are when you have a question. Uh, and then you submit the online application form. So this is our application form. Uh, the first thing that you'll do is select the type of grant for the application. So I'm going to, for uh, the sake of doing the, the biggest one, do transformation grant, requested an amount of funding. I'm just going to write out a test thing that puts 100,000 in <laughs> because it's silly. Um, my application name, so I'm just going to put test for all of these. And I do not have a submitter, uh, so the applicant is the same. Um, employee RDs are only used by RPA to uh, see in the long run if these grants um, are still uh, encouraging no cost materials and low cost materials use. This is for some cool banner stuff that they're doing in the background. This is not shared with anybody. That's why it's not on the Word document too, because we share out the Word document as a proposal. We do not share out employee IDs, um, including the applicant. How many people are in the grants project team? Well, I'll say two. That means that um, there is one other team member. So I will say that this person is a test at test.com. I think I also have to do that at my email. Is so it like this needs to be a real email? And then go to next. So in transformation grants, you have to put in a little bit of um, 
yeah, it, you have to put in a little bit of numbers here. So the course number, the course title, the students per summer, students per fall, students per spring. Uh oh, it's gone off the page. You just scroll using the bar right here. Total students per year, savings per student, uh, total savings per year. Don't do this kind of math for sure. Um, actually have numbers ready to go. Uh, are you planning on creating or revising any open materials? If I say yes, then they'll ask some questions about uh, Creative Commons licensing. I'm just going to say no. See how it all disappears that way? Uh, this is stuff about remixing and revising. But check any priority categories. Uh, these are in the RFP. And then you upload the Word document, the letter of support, and your business or grants office acknowledgement form here. And then the next time that you hit next after you've submitted these, you're all done. You get an email that says that you've submitted your project um, and we will have it. Uh, so that is the entire process. You have now applied for a grant. So I am going to go back over to here and I am going to share this guy again. And before you move on to the next one, Jeff, we've got a couple of questions in chat. Uh-oh, hold on a second. Go ahead. Yep, we just got a couple of questions in chat, and so I wanted to bring a few to your attention. One, uh, Professor Liu would like to know whether or not um, there is any successful research grant examples. Um, and I mentioned that we don't, our pilot round is still in progress, so we don't have any completed projects published. But I think she may be speaking about grant applications. So um, I'm not sure um, if that's the case, but if you would speak to whether or not we have any successful research grant examples. Um, yeah, so the current research grants are just going on. So I would say for now, I would say use your best judgment and try to put a, a good proposal together. Um, completed research grants will be shared at the end of next year. So then you'll have some good examples, uh, but you would be one of the first. Um, I did hear from David uh, about having not the uh, not having the timeline or task being an Excel format. That's for a little bit of uh, screen reading accessibility purposes, uh, just in case. Uh, so a bullet point list probably works a little bit better for that. If you need to put them in a table format, that's that is perfectly fine. It's getting easier and easier for us to read tables in Word. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, yeah, it it should be okay if you do it that way. Nakita, am I missing any questions? Nope, that is it. I was just double checking. And the last question was related to whether or not um, we would be sending out a link of the recording. And I did mention that we will be doing that as well as posting the link of this recording to the round 25 application page. Yep, we'll have a list of uh, attendees and at that point we'll be able to send all of that out. That was it for the, the chat question so far. Oh, uh, hold on, I'm going a little bit too far here. Whoop. OK, so I have a more detailed section just in case we have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time. We only get seven minutes. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly through this part. Um, there are uh, three rubrics. They are a little bit different. They are weighted differently, so be sure to check them out. Uh, there's one for each category. Administrative reviews happen after peer reviews. We check for errors, uh, especially ones that are numerical. So let's say uh, that you said you're going to save your students $20 million a year. Chances are something went wrong in typing those numbers out. So we would have to go back, reach out to you and see if th that was actually the case. Um, Dr. Liu says, how many projects normally are awarded each round? We usually award, I would say 27 to 30 or so, but it depends on what's applying, right? Let's say that we have a whole bunch of amazing transformation grants and they are all somewhere near the maximum, 29,000, 30,000, that kind of thing. That in our budget leaves less room for more and more projects, right? Um, as opposed to, let's say that we have a whole bunch of really good continuous improvement grants. The maximum on those is 10,000. So we may be awarding more that time around um, while keeping within the same budget. But I would say 
in between 25, 35, that's usually around how much? Um, oh, OK. Uh, yep, she, Abby's going to review the recording. Thank you. So we also check to make sure that the budget meets the guidelines, uh, that it actually does line up with the maximum per grant project, maximum per team member. In the transformation grants, we are definitely looking at the numbers. Um, we also look at whether or not you have a plan to share your new materials. So if you say, well, they're going to be shared with students in D2L, that's great for those students. That's not great for sharing them out as open resources because nobody can get to them except for those students. And even then, uh, those students will lose access to them eventually. So be sure that you have a plan to share the new materials that you've created in this grant uh, out. And we host materials. You'll just have to send them to us and just let us know that that's how you're going to do it, um, if that's the case. Uh, others do it on a website, a libguide. If you have a librarian to help you out, that's really cool. Um, yeah, it really depends on the group. Now, there are our priority categories. These do not disqualify you if you don't meet a priority category. They give you a, a small amount of extra points that can help, but they are not going to disqualify you from it. So if you don't meet one of these priority categories in a transformation grant proposal, do not worry. The good proposals are the ones we are looking for. Uh, but we are looking for collaborative projects where you bring in uh, folks that aren't just faculty in your department. Um, instructional designers when you need instructional design support, librarians if you need help finding and uh, hosting materials or if you need help with copyright, OER publishers, so the UNG Press, just like it says on the RFP, they can be a uh, part of this team. Um, web designers, programmers, graphic designers, whoever it is you need. Uh, if it's a more collaborative, collaborative project, it'll be a more successful project. That's what we've seen. Um, if you are involving students in creating and adapting and like highly evaluating materials, then you would qualify for the student participation uh, one. And that um, for a lot of courses, it involves some really meaningful work that can sometimes involve students in creative ways that help them be part of the education process more than usual. It's very cool. Uh, department scaling process uh, projects. So maybe you have a small project and you're going to bring it to a department level. Uh, the department needs to commit to at least pilot the project in all sections for that first semester in that category. If you have the potential for departmental scaling, that doesn't count here. Um, we're not looking for potential numbers. We are looking for direct. And then upper level campus collaborations. It's tough to address upper level courses in a transformation grant because the student impact is going to be smaller. The courses usually have a smaller amount of enrollees. But if you collaborate across um, different institutions on that same course, that can, um, that can drive up the amount of impacts that the project is going to have. So collaborating across institutions has a priority here as well. Uh, so a little bit on how funding works. We only have two minutes, so I'm not going to do too much of this. Funding goes to the institution through a service level agreement. Uh, you may be familiar with that. You may not. Uh, be sure to read up on it on the RFP. Um, there are some things that grants and research offices need to know. Um, they are state funds. They need to comply with state, VOR, and institutional policies. They do not usually include federal or external grant guidelines. Uh, those are way more restrictive uh, than ones that are shared between members of the same organization, but this can vary. They do not include indirect expenses. Indirect expenses are things like uh, F&A, which are facilities and administration. Um, they do cover direct expenses. Direct expenses include fringes, and that is part of your maximum $5,000. So be sure to know that it's not just you are going to get $5,000 in your salary after taxes and all that. Fringes are included, and they differ per institution, and they differ per your position, too. Um, any questions about all of this uh, before we adjourn? Yes, uh, Matthew. Yeah, um, so I'm 
thinking about uh, I have a student in mind to put on my team for an application and uh, that students also applying for some other summer internships, et cetera. So I guess the question is, if I have a named student on my application, but then that student ends up with a different opportunity that's that's going to take precedent. Is it a big problem if I substitute one student for another after the proposal has been submitted? So the way that I would do this is um, budget in a student assistant per semester. And that way uh, you don't have to name the student at the time and that student assistant can change over time. Um, it's not going to matter in the review process what name that student has, right? So it could be that you wind up with that student for all of the semesters. That's great. Or you could just have one student this time, another student the other time. Um, I would just keep that generic uh, because we know that it's subject to chaos for sure. Um, yep, uh, Marnie, that pr this presentation will be online on the apply for a grant page. It will be listed there. Um, yeah, and we'll be linking it there and uh, emailing everybody who attended so long as the attendee list is the same that it used to be. Uh, our registration link broke because Teams decided to update itself. So I'm hoping that the attendee list is the same. If not, we'll send it out through the newsletter um, and through our grantee list too. And Jeff, we have a question from Professor Liu. Does the research grant also need a minimum of two team members? No, uh, so it, it works just like a continuous improvement grant. It can be uh, one or it can be more. Um, and there's also uh, at this point, transformation grants are extensible. You can do a one person team all the way up to, uh, you know, six, eight, however many you need. Um, yeah. All right, that's all the questions in the chat so far. All right, uh, if you have any other questions, please get in contact with us. Uh, thank you so much uh, for attending today. It was great to see uh, all of you here uh, returning and new and so many of you, despite the broken registration form, which we are hopefully going to see an improvement on uh, on Microsoft's part. But thanks so much, um, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you, Nikita. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.